Coming up on Tech News Weekly, I review the OnePlus Bullets Wireless 2 earphones, also new tariffs and how they directly affect smartphone and laptop manufacturing. AI is making whiskey and translating language into drunk languages. Uh, and are kids today watching less commercials? We talk about that and more next on Tech News Weekly. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Tech News Weekly, episode 83, recorded Thursday, May 16th, 2019. This episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by IT Pro TV, providing effective training with access to virtual labs and practice tests. Visit go.itpro.tv slash TNW. You can take advantage of their lowest prices of the season. For an additional 30% off for the lifetime of your active subscription, use code TNW30 at checkout. And by CashFly, give your users the seamless online experience they want. Power your site or app with CashFly CDN, that's a content delivery network, and be 30% faster than the competition. Learn more at twit.cashfly.com. And by Gazelle, the trusted online marketplace for buying and selling used devices. Visit gazelle.com slash twit to buy a certified pre-owned device and get 10% off your purchase. Well, hello there. Welcome to Tech News Weekly. This is a show where every week we talk to the people making and breaking the tech news. I am Megan Maroney. I'm Jason Howell. Sometimes we don't talk to someone, we break it ourselves. Well, I'm going to talk to you and you're breaking the news. Oh, okay. Although I don't know how much breaking news this is, but uh, <laughs> OnePlus... Had a big week. Unless you were hiding under a rock, you probably saw a million and one tech journalists, myself included, post a review of the OnePlus 7 Pro earlier this week. That's this tall drink of water right here. <laughs> uh, but OnePlus had another product as part of that release that didn't get as much attention. And that's what I have right here. These are the OnePlus Bullets Wireless 2 earphones. They're an upgrade to the debut product that they uh, announced and released last year that cost a measly $69 then. These are a bit more expensive. They're going to run you $99 this time around, so they've definitely boosted the price. But I have to say, normally I'm a, I'm like I'm a growing fan of wireless earbuds right now. Uh, I've never really liked the neck bud style, which is exactly what these are. They kind of fit around your neck, and I'll show it off in a second. These are perhaps, though, the best neck buds that I've used to date. You kind of almost forget that they're there because you can kind of see they're very... Flimsy is the wrong word because that gives it a negative comment. Flexible? Con flexible. That's mm -hmm. probably a better better word. Like when I put it on, I'll go ahead and throw it around my, my neck here. It's just like a scarf, like yeah, a you know, No big deal. <laughs> I'm just, you know, wearing my stylish headphone scarf. Uh -huh. um, but they rest really nicely and they kind of cup around the neck. Like I've used neck buds before that feel like they're always going to fall off. And these don't do that. So you can kind of see uh, this is actually magnetic and the ear the earphones are magnetic. So when I break the connection, it automatically powers the earbuds on and it automatically connected to the OnePlus 7 Pro that I have over there. If I cup it back together, uh, snap it back together with the magnet, it instantly pauses whatever audio is playing and disconnects. So it's saving the battery on the earbuds uh, once it's snapped together. So it makes it really easy. Like when you're out about, you just pull it, drop it in the ear and whoa, I just heard a little, uh, blink blink thing. And I know that I'm connected and I could listen to my music, but if it's, uh, I think they fit really nice for $99. Like these things yeah. I think are a really good value and it doesn't look as awkward. Like I have also these Jabra Elite 65 mm. E's. These are $200 mm. and you can see how kind of like rigid, and huge and bulky the kind of neck neck band is, mm -hmm. which is kind of of this style of earbud or headphone, whatever you want to call it. That's what I hate most is like this really yeah. big kind of unit that's like resting on the back of your neck and it's impossible to forget that it's there. I feel like with the uh, the Bullets Wireless 2, you really do forget that they're there. Is the sound better in the Jabra? The, the Jabras do sound nice, um, I will say. Um, the Jabra Elite 65 T's are the earbud versions of these that don't have the neck bud. Mm -hmm. And that is 
my preference um, all around for um, wireless earbuds at the amazing. moment. I love them. They sound amazing. Mm -hmm. So you get the same sound out of these, but you get this huge thing mm -hmm. resting on your neck. Um, as for these, the OnePlus Bullets Wireless 2 earphones, the sound is actually really good. They've upgraded these. Here, I'll take it off my neck so we can kind of show it down here. Um, they've upgraded the drivers in these. It was one driver on last year's model. So that's probably part of the reason why the cost has has increased a little bit. Um, they now contain three drivers, two Knolls Armature drivers and one Gore-Tec driver uh, upgraded from one. So you end up with just a better separation of frequencies across the board, uh, more dedicated uh, drivers to certain frequency types. And I feel like that just makes for a better sound. And so you said they fit great in your ears. Yeah. Um, everyone's ears are not shaped the same. That's true. Um, do they have uh, other little buds? Yes, little okay. tips. You get, um, I think you get three different options of sizes for the ear tips. These are the ones that came shipped with mm -hmm. and strange for me because I'm a really tall person. So normally things don't fit me the mm -hmm. first time. And, but you know, that doesn't matter when you're talking about ear holes and uh, these fit me just fine. Uh, but you have a couple of different options and uh, good isolation. I would say, you know, sometimes on these, you get better isolation than others. And I feel like it's kind of the right balance. It's not totally and completely blocked off from the real world, uh, but blocked off enough, mm -hmm. you know, so you get the nice, nice, rich sound. But not noise canceling. Not noise canceling. No, definitely not noise canceling uh, in these. What else do we have? Uh, USB-C for charging. So it is USB-C fast charge capable. And what that amounts to is, uh, what is it? 10 minutes will get you 10 hours of battery life. <laughs> so you could just plug it right in with USB-C. It charges it up super fast. The capacity is around 14 hours of playback. And yeah, battery was really impressive on these. I felt like I hardly ever had to even plug it in. In fact, I think the only time I had to plug it in was before this review because mm -hmm. I'd been using these nonstop and still like I'd check in my phone and it would still have tons of battery. You know, it's like 80% remaining. And I'm like, yeah. on any other earbuds, like I would have had to have charged by then. So they automatically pair with the OnePlus. Will they automatically pair with a Samsung phone or my iPhone? Yeah. So when I took these out of the box and, you know, and basically turned on the OnePlus 7 Pro, it's like they automatically recognized each other. And mm -hmm. I got a little pop up that said, do you want to pair? And it was like, oh, wow, that was the easiest thing yeah. in the world. Uh, with my Pixel 3, I had to go into my Bluetooth settings basically and just say, look for discoverable devices. But it was there. It was mm -hmm. super easy. It was like one step more and I was able mm -hmm. to pair it to the Pixel 3. Yeah. And yeah, that wasn't a problem at all. Well, I have been uh, using the new Powerbeats Pro, which are $250. They don't have any neck thing. They're just the buds, yeah. which I love and they yeah, fit I over love the that ears. Um, but, uh, but I mean, even though I love them, $250 is a lot to it pay. Is. Um, and Leo and I had this discussion uh, on iOS today that the uh, you there's tons. If you go to Amazon and search just for like earbuds, any popular earbud, there's going to be like some Chinese knockoff that's going to be like ten or fifteen or twenty dollars. Um, and then Anchor even has like a twenty or th maybe it's fifty dollar uh, earbuds that look just like that. But uh, do you think those are more of a better construction than what you might just find randomly on? Amazon. Like in the two to three hundred dollar range? No, in the like fifty dollar. I think so. These are solid. Like these are really solid. And and I mean, obviously the sixty nine dollar price range of the original version of these earphones was like ridiculous and kind of unheard of for the mm -hmm. quality that you got. I still feel like a hundred dollars for these earphones is totally worth it. I mean, the, the, the quality of the construction, it feels like this is going to last a very long time. It feels like if you're working out with these, you know, this kind of almost rubbery kind of silicone uh, shape around the neck, like this is going to be right for those, those experiences. So I imagine these would get pretty good longevity and for a hundred bucks, especially like you said, like two to $300 sometimes for these things, yeah. which is a lot, uh, supports Bluetooth 5.0. It can connect to two devices at any time. And of course you've got the controls, uh, the inline controls here that I can show off, uh, you know, for, for pausing, uh, track forward, track back, all that stuff. And I mentioned two devices at a time. There's a little button on the side here. So if I'm connected to two different devices, I can hot switch between them by by just hitting that button. It'll automatically connect me over. So that's really nice. It supports Qualcomm's Aptex uh, HD codec, 
which is better than your standard Bluetooth codec. It basically, it's a, uh, uh, more and more phones are supporting this, this new style of Bluetooth codec, but mm -hmm. it essentially allows for super high res uh, quality transferring over because a lot of people have complaints about Bluetooth audio yeah. and this is kind of a way around that. So thankfully it, it supports that. So when you say more and more phones, are they mostly Android phones that support that or do iPhones support? Apple? I don't think that the iPhone supports yeah, that. Yeah, I don't think they do either. Uh, but yes, you're finding it in more and more Android phones. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really good spec for, uh, for them to add into these phones. Um, what else? I mean, they sound great. I, I really enjoyed listening to music and I listen to a lot of, you know, podcasts and audiobooks. Obviously you don't need amazing sound when you're listening to podcasts necessarily, like, but, but with music, like I felt like I got a nice rich, uh, representation of music, nice low end when they were fitting properly. And that's always a, you know, kind of a consideration with the earbud style thing. What about phone calls? Uh, phone calls sound great, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I had a call with my wife and asked her how, you know, how I sounded and mm -hmm. she didn't seem to flinch. So I think it just kind of <laughs> sounded normal to her, which is kind of what I hope for <laughs> instead of the, what? I didn't hear your question. Yeah. Uh, but overall, I, I think, uh, I think OnePlus in, you know, both in phones and in some of the other hardware that they're doing, they're really showing that they know how to make high quality stuff mm -hmm. and in with the budget in mind. Mm -hmm. And this is no different for a hundred dollars. I really do recommend uh, the bullets wireless two earphones. I think they're great. Awesome. Yeah. So I'm going to go ahead and not listen to them right now though. Well, you can, a show. I mean, <laughs> if you want to, I can, I can take over. I did it okay. last week by myself. All right. If you have music you want to listen to. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing that I need to listen to right okay. now. Uh, but maybe when O Doctor's on later, I'll yes. listen to some, some bump and tunes. <laughs> Coming up, Russell Brandom from The Verge uh, is going to be here to tell us which tech companies are going to suffer the most from the U.S.-China trade war. But first, this episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by... IT Pro TV, experienced IT professionals who deliver comprehensive training at the click of your mouse. Uh, spring is here, of course. There's never been a better time than now to take advantage of their lowest prices ever. You can purchase a standard membership, which is video only, for $28.50 per month. Or you can upgrade to a premium membership, which is video, also labs and practice tests. Those will come in really handy for you. That's $42 a month. Uh, you can save even more than that, though. IT Pro TV is still honoring our special offer, which is 30% off for Twit listeners. So an additional 30% off. That drops the standard membership to only $19.95 per month or $199 per year. And the premium to $29.50 a month or $295 per year. That's less than $1 a day for premium membership. You can probably spend more on your daily cup of coffee, really. Stream IT Pro TV's courses live and on demand worldwide. You can use Chromecast, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Apple TV, PC. They have iOS and Android apps. All across the board, you can find their content. And new content is added daily, so your training is always aligned with the latest certifications and the most current exams. Episodes go from studio to web in just 24 hours, so quick turnaround for that. IT Pro TV is CompTIA's uh, official video training partner. Uh, 12 CompTIA on-demand courses, CompTIA A+, Network Plus, and Security Plus certs. Uh, and a whole lot more. Just visit go.itpro.tv slash TNW, and you'll use the code TNW30. That'll get you started with your standard or premium membership. And you can do that today. Don't let another season pass you by without earning your IT certifications. That's go.itpro.tv slash TNW, and make sure and use code TNW30. You'll get an additional 30% off for the lifetime of your active subscription. IT Pro TV, flexible training, binge-worthy content, life-changing results. Thank you, IT Pro TV. If you hadn't already heard, the U.S. and China are kind of in the midst of a trade dispute. A number of tariffs have been flying in both directions throughout the past year, all in an effort to reach a new trade deal between the two nations. But the latest tariffs directly affect, seem to anyways, technology companies. And uh, we have Russell Branham from The Verge uh, to welcome to the show to talk all about it. Welcome, Russell. Hi, thanks for having me. It's great to have you here. Thank you for hopping on today. So you wrote about these tariffs. You called it a nightmare scenario for manufacturers, <laughs> which got my attention. First, talk a little bit about the tariffs announced on Monday and what kinds of technology will be directly affected most. Yeah, so it's, uh, 
it's kind of everything that's left. We had seen in earlier in September an earlier round went in, and they they were kind of uh, it was a along with sort of the steel and soybean tariffs we'd seen previous ones on computer components a lot of freestanding batteries things like that and one of the things that was said at the time was they were like look if you if you're going to add product like if you're going to add tariffs on more products it's going to have to really be everything else those previous tariffs were sort of written in a way that it avoided the big ticket items like smartphones laptops the stuff that people are really sort of watching the price when they buy and that, uh, you know, in just whole industries in the U.S. are really counting on. Uh, now it's kind of everything that's left. I think the one thing that uh, has been left out is pharmaceuticals. But I think if you're manufacturing goods in China at this point, you are getting hit by this in some way. And when do these go into effect? Like, I, I imagine, like, this isn't an immediate as of now. There's got to be a little bit of ramp up. And, and why would there be any sort of ramp up or delay on these going? Yeah. Into so um, officially, it's in, on June 17th, they're going to start sort of talks about it. And then on June 25th, it's scheduled to go into effect. The talks, hmm. the June 17th stuff is is sort of there's a comment period where citizens can weigh in and sort of people can say, oh, this is going to be bad for my business. Uh, otherwise, I mean, I will say that's a very, very short window of time for to, between announcing a tariff and the tariff going into effect. Hmm. Usually with, with the point of these things is to give people time to shift their uh, manufacturing so that it's not in China, right? You say, okay, anyone after this date who's still importing TVs from China – is going to get hit with this tariff, so you better move your stuff to Mexico. You have one year, and then that's already itself a hard enough task. If you say, "Okay, you have you know six or seven weeks," there's just nothing people can do to avoid. Like, I mean, that that is not enough time to change the way you are building your product in any kind of reasonable way. So, uh, the thing that people are hoping, and this also just adds to the uncertainty, is. There's a G20 meeting in June. We know that Trump and uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping are both going to be there. They will presumably talk about this. It, we've already been through a couple sort of cycles where they were getting together to talk about a trade deal and it sort of fell apart. But that's really the last ditch thing before these go into effect. And of course, there's another round of Chinese tariffs on American goods that will also go into effect if those that that sort of round of things fails. Hmm. So when what kind of effects will consumers start to feel and, and when will they feel them if these do go into effect? Uh, yeah, so that's where things get interesting. Generally, there are only three things like there are three places the money can come from. Right. So this is a, it's a tax that's collected on goods as they're imported. So so it is collecting this money. Where does the money come from? Either. The company just eats the cost or this, they use this to negotiate a better deal from suppliers and say, hey, give it to me a little cheaper because I got to pay this tax, which you can get a little bit of give on. But generally, they just sort of pass it along to consumers. I mean, I think the uh, JP Morgan did a survey. It's not an exact one to one thing because what are the values of the goods as they're imported versus the retail value when they're sold? Uh, we only ever see the retail price. But. If you think about so, so their estimate was that a thousand dollar iPhone XS would have to be it would ha it would add one hundred and forty nine dollars to the price tag of that if wow. they just passed it along. Right. Probably Apple's margins are high enough and they were sp they had a pretty specific reason to put the iPhone XS at one thousand dollars and they probably don't want to abandon that as you know, just because of this. So they will probably just eat the cost because they're Apple and they can, and they have all this cash in the bank and who knows how long any of this will last. But if you're Lenovo, if you're HP, if you're sort of a more, uh, commodity cost conscious product, you probably don't have that much room to give those margins on, you know, if, if you're not Apple and you're importing electronics from China, your margins are usually pretty small. And that ends up with costs just passed directly along to the consumer. I mean, and there's sort of, you know, that's what taxes do. It's a sales tax. 
Yeah, and there's so much. I mean, we were just talking about OnePlus in the previous segment. There's so many, you know, brands now, at least in the world of smartphones, that are hinging themselves around this kind of quality components at a lower price. This uh, this would potentially, depending on the company, almost force them to kind of raise their prices and goes goes kind of against what they're all about in the first place at that point. Uh, that's a that's a big challenge. How long will it take for these price increases? Do you think to be visible to to buyers? Do you expect people to like? It's like get them while you can, get in there fast because suddenly <laughs> you know you're you're basically saving a certain percentage if you buy now versus waiting. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think probably we're at least safe until June, and I think. Uh, you know, supply chains are very complicated things. Uh, part of the question you're asking is like, how much stock does Lenovo have in its warehouse? And mm -hmm. how much can it import before the deadline goes in right. to put in a warehouse in California somewhere that where then it can be sort of moved out? Um, I don't know. It's tricky. Again, like you also don't want to raise the price too much or drop it too much. So mm -hmm. like they may just decide okay, we have this new thing. We're going to raise the price on that to recoup. The, you know, the way these things get set are very complicated. Uh, and, and so that that can be a little tricky to say. The other thing I would say is like in the long, long term, three, four, five years from now, if these are still in effect then, the companies, their first reaction when they see this is, okay, how do we get around this? Everything we're making in China, let's just send it to Europe. And let's sort of create some new place outside of China to create the stuff that's going to the U.S. so that won't get hit with the tariffs. That's pretty hard to do. Electronics manufacturing is not like a simple business. There's not that many places outside of China to do it, but there are other places. Everyone is now going to be rushing to those places. But eventually they will set that up and that will just be sort of a permanent shift because – you, now you never know. You know, you think about five years ago, who thought that in 2019 they would be dealing with a 25 percent tax on all the electronics that were coming from China into the U.S.? You never would have prepared for that kind of contingency. You know, they just it would have seemed impossible. So now we're having to bet what are the trade barriers going to be between, you know, what are the trade barriers going to be in 2024 it's it's a hard question. You got to kind of see the future. Yeah, absolutely. So you you spoke earlier about uh, how companies reshape their supply chain and how it usually can take up to a year, and they don't have a year. Are companies already starting to do that now, just in preparation, just uh, as these continue? Yeah. It's so. I, I mean, it's tricky because also they don't want to say too much about where they're building what they're building because you know, trade secrets and all that. I will say one of the names that's been thrown around a lot is that Samsung has actually already started to do this and is probably not going to get hit that hard by this because they have so many sort of solid uh, manufacturing outposts outside of China in places like Vietnam or elsewhere in Southeast Asia. Why did they choose to do that? Was it because they saw sort of the whole Trump situation coming? I don't know. Or, or was it that there was sort of you know, there's a lot of other kind of contingencies to the like politics of China and Korea. Um, but I, there are companies who have started to shift away from China. And in many cases, you know, it, it's been cheaper if they're if you're sort of able to do it right. Uh, but there's just still a lot of manufacturing for U.S. customers that happens in China. I mean, it is the global hub of this stuff. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I do think this is one of those times where you find out who's getting hit and who has sort of secretly been preparing for this for, for the last few years. Yeah. Right. Who, who has had the foresight and, uh, and the, just the straight up ability to, mm -hmm. to weather the storm. Well, I guess we'll find out what, what is, what is not touched yet? Like as, as relates to technology, we're talking about, you know, earlier tariffs touching parts of technology, this being a pretty major one for things that we talk about all the time, things like computers and cell phones and stuff. Uh, what's the next frontier, the, <laughs> the next tariff frontier, uh, as, as far as what we can look forward to, uh, with technology. Well, yeah, so I mean, it may not be tariffs. It may get into sort of hairier business. There's this whole situation with Huawei and, oh, you know, right. executives being arrested in Canada. Canadian executives in China have since been detained seemingly in retaliation. Yeah. If 
this is going to really be playing hardball, which it seems like it is. And so we go through another, you know, no one thought that we would get here, right? Like the, the, even before these came in, there was another round that went from 10% tax to 25% tax. And everyone said, oh, they'll never let that happen. You know, by the time that's going to go into effect, we will have worked out a deal. It's just pressure for the deal. Well, if this keeps escalating, then yeah, I mean, Apple has a lot of sort of operations in China. Does it get harder for Apple and other United States companies to operate in China just on a very basic, like, can I get to the office? Can I enter the country in, you know, in order to do the business of Apple there? Or are they just going to go into the Apple store and say, oh, no, this this belongs to the government now, right? Hmm. And that's I don't think we're going to get that far, but also I didn't think we would get as far as we are now. So if things get really hairy, there is other stuff other than taxing imports that that China can do, hmm. uh, which is sort of an alarming place to be. Uh, and, and there's other stuff we can do, too. So I don't know. I hope it doesn't get there, but you never know. What about all of the stuff? I mean, any popular tech product, um, if you go on Amazon, you can find like a Chinese knockoff. Um, you know, so many, you can buy, find dozens of them. Or if you, you know, go to AliExpress, you can buy just basically anything cheap. Is that going to change? I mean, I think that's part of what we're trying to change, I think. We being the U.S. negotiating side is there's for years and years, I mean, I, I don't want to make it sound like the status quo before this was all great, right? Like there were, you know, there was, you know, hacking industrial espionage. There was uh, a lot of just sort of general currency manipulation and, and and a lot of sort of strong arming of U.S. companies in order to, to have access to this great manufacturing hub and this great market. Um, and part of the point of trying to get a trade deal is to say, hey, like you have to, take seriously not knocking off products. You have to take seriously not sort of stealing intellectual property from the companies that are manufacturing there. Uh, and just kind of a lot of the things that China has been getting away with forever, we want them to kind of play by the same rules as everyone else. Uh, there's a world in which that happens. I don't know that this feels really like how you get there. Uh it seems more likely that we'll just start back at the beginning where we were and say, all right, well, at least the tariffs are over or something like that. I mean, I I don't know. I think that's certainly the deal we're trying to get, but it feels like it's getting farther away. Yeah, really does. Uh, Russell Brandom from The Verge. Russell, thank you so much for hopping on and taking time out of your day to, to join us. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. You have a good one. All right. Thank Everybody you. follow his work on TheVerge.com. Coming up, Owen J.J. Stone joins us to pick apart a few random tech stories of the week. But first, this episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by Cashfly. Give your users the seamless online experience they want. Power your site or your app with Cashfly CDN and be 30% faster than the competition. No matter what industry your business is in, if your website is directly tied to company revenue, give your customers the fast downloads they need with Cashfly. Cashfly CDN delivers rich media content up to 10 times faster than traditional delivery methods and up to 30% faster than other major CDNs. Backed by a 100% SLA, Cashfly guarantees the best user experience for all your customers, no matter where they are or what the device they're on. Join the thousands of others who trust Cashfly's reliable network, including LG, Microsoft, Adobe, and Ars Technica. If you watch our podcast or listen, you understand how fast Cashfly is because we've been hosting all of all of our podcasts, all the audio, all the video on Cashfly. We've been doing so for about a decade. And every month our viewers and listeners download petabytes of data fast and flawlessly. Twit would literally not exist without Cashfly. Say goodbye to logging in multiple times a week or worse, even every day trying to track your CDN usage. You don't got that kind of time. And you don't want billing spikes either. You don't. You will not have billing spikes with Cashfly. You get a custom plan tailored to your CDN needs based on yearly usage trends. On average, customers who switch to Cashfly will save more than 20%. Just imagine what you could do with that 20% in your time. Okay, I've got a deal for you. Just for you, you twit listener or watcher, Cashfly is giving away a complimentary detailed analysis of your current CDN bill and your usage trends. See if you're overpaying 20% or more for CDN 
Learn all about that deal at twit.cashfly.com. That's twit.cashfly.com. And we thank Cashfly for their support of the show. All right. So usually this is the part of the show where Megan and I pick a few stories. We call them stories of the week, stories that might not be the biggest news, but sometimes it's it's things that just kind of catch our eyes and that we think are kind of interesting. We thought this time we'd bring a guest on to hash these out with us. Welcome to the show, Owen J.J. Stone, O Doctor. What's up, party people? How you doing today? I'm doing great. <laughs> Answer for myself. I'm excited to be here. I missed you guys. I love you so much. It's been too long. I'm not saying you didn't invite me enough, but I'm just saying it's been a while and I've been waiting for it. So I'm glad to be here. Good to see you. We're happy to have you here and we're sorry. You know, sometimes we just, we get busy, Owen. We get busy know, with the show. You, traveling, you know, getting yeah. out in the Iowa. I see you out there in these streets, busy, <laughs> making new friends, doing other podcasts. I, I know you got a life, but I'm just saying I'm here for you guys. We're That's always all. thinking of you, though. Mm -hmm. Always. Always. <laughs> Off the air, like I said, I love it when you lie to me. It sounds so good. <laughs> I'll repeat it because it still sounds good. <laughs> Why don't we dive in? Uh, let's see here. I think this first story we can probably all relate to. Kids mm -hmm. these days, kids these days, they have it easy. In this day and age of Netflix-only homes, kids can simply watch endless streams of content without advertising cruft getting in the way. Pfft advertising. Uh, University of Michigan published a study where it looked at television consumption rates for U.S. children 2 to 11. It found that 2 to 5-year-olds average around 1,600 hours per year of TV watching. 6 to 11-year-olds spend more than 1,450 hours watching TV per year. I'm guessing the drop is because they then have phones. Uh, and a 2014 Nielsen report shows an average hour of TV programming contains roughly 15 minutes and 30 seconds of commercials. So, a site called localbabysitter.com wrote an article. They did the math. They found that two to five-year-olds in Netflix-only homes avoid more than 400 hours of commercials each year, and six to 11-year-olds avoid 360 hours each year of advertisements. Uh, it really adds up, doesn't it? <laughs> huh? Yeah. Okay, sorry for the dad joke. Uh, womp, what, womp. Yeah. Really need some sad trombone on here. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Owen? Uh, does this add up for you? Uh, this is the this article is like six years too late from what I understand of uh, information. I mean, my daughter since the age of two hasn't had to deal with commercials because obviously I was downloading stuff ahead of time. But from Netflix to just streaming things and just DVDs, I just didn't want my kid watching commercials. Every parent hates when a kid walks up to them and says, "I want this crappy thing for twenty four ninety nine that's going to fall apart." So. This is the best thing in the world. The one thing about the article that made me laugh the most was at the end when they're like, oh, um, kids not watching commercials early on in life and then later on watching commercials makes them less – could make them less cynical towards advertisement, which I find to be the exact opposite. Since my daughter doesn't watch advertisement at all, when she sees an advertisement, she's vocally critical. Like that was a horrible ad. Like what are they trying to sell? Like she actually points stuff out like – Oh, that was really good. Like she says something, but most of the time it's just trash. So I think it automatically makes her more critical because she's like, why are you wasting my time with these trash ads? And she's only 11. So, I mean, I feel like everybody's already been raising their kids with Netflix since okay. Netflix uh, digital was available. Yeah, we were we were a Netflix only house. I was very proud of it. Um, for a while, we didn't even have a television. So, uh, oh I, my god! And what? then I know, I know. Did you have a game system, uh, Megan? <laughs> no, no. We're finding out way too much information this week. You're like hurting my brain. You didn't have a TV for a while. We did not have a TV, and um, yeah, it was it was great. Except for when my kids would go over to anyone else's house, and they uh. were like, "TV, TV, I watch TV." Um, and you know, I th I think it's I'm still happy that we did it that way. And then you know, we ne we haven't had cable since they were born, so um, you know, they really haven't had commercials until they started watching YouTube. And yeah. this article points this out. But like YouTube, in addition to the uh, millions of ads tailored right exactly to them. YouTube itself is a commercial. Like yeah, as really we is. talked about last week, um, my boys wanted the Oculus Quest. And why did they want it? Because of YouTube, because all of their YouTubers were reviewing it and talking about it. I mean, they wouldn't have even known about it, but they needed to have it. And it's not the crappy $12 thing that's going to fall apart, I hope, but it's all one ad. So it's kind of like maybe like I did something good by not, you know, for not showing them, you know, not constantly showing them ads when they were little, but 
I don't know. It just feels like they're going to get it somehow. We're kind of in that business too, though. I mean, earlier the, earlier yeah. this show, I showed off a pair of headphones to everybody. So yeah. you know. I, I was I was just going to say, your kids must not care about what you're doing any day. Like, well, like right. you just get to play with stuff and review things. It, so the advertisement of a game system or whatever works, I guess. But at the same time, I see countless kids because I'm around way too many children all the time. Watch um, unboxing of things. Yeah. Or watch video game walkthroughs. Okay, so we're talking about game systems. My daughter's had a game system in her room for forever. She only plays when her friends are over. But I've watched her watch other people playing games more than she plays the game itself. I'm like, you own this game. Why don't you go play it? Like, same thing with the toys. They're like, I don't need a toy. I watch them open and play with it. I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> How do you get any joy out of that? So the, the brain mechanism now with all the unboxing and kids playing with toys online is really, I don't know how you're going to quantify it or study it, but that whole concept of, I don't need to play the game, I can watch them play the game. I don't need to have the toy, I can watch them play the toy. And if I really, really want it, then I guess I could get it. But I mean, I've already seen it, people having fun with it. And I'm like, that's weird to me because yeah. I'm old, I guess. Yeah. Um, I have the situation. So my daughters are six and nine. And I have the situation where they're watching YouTube and I walk in and they're watching a video that is nothing but commercials because they're so unused to watching commercials, I think, because, you know, we, we don't really we don't have like live TV yeah. or anything like that, that they'll watch like a compilation of Doritos ads or something because they're funny or whatever. <laughs> and like they will choose that. I'm like, wow, this is so backwards. Like, what have I done here? Like, it's like you it's like you you remove something thinking it's not it's going going to protect them, which is not what we're doing with with ads. We just don't have any you know actual tv in our house um that isn't like streaming from netflix or anything but they end up finding it anyways and it's almost like it's more appealing because they haven't seen it before so yeah, yeah it, the, i don't know it's a whole weird paradigm like i said i i always check in on what she's watching and sometimes the things she watches i literally want to say that's stupid but then i think to myself I'm consuming all kinds of weird content that she wouldn't care about or yeah. somebody else wouldn't care about. So I can't really say that it's dumb, but it's like, it's so weird. Yep. You know, w watching somebody open 10,000 packs of pencils. I'm like, wait, what? Somebody open what? They're opening pencils. That's all they're doing. I want to open 10,000 pencils though. I'm like, wait, what? I don't, I don't want to, what is the value? And they're, they're not funny. They're not, they're just like, Oh, here's pack 275. I'm like, I understand why you're watching this. Yeah. And also TV's in the house for eye strain purposes. I always yell at her for being up on her phone like this. I'm like, yo, you got a TV, beam it to the TV. Yeah. Yeah. Beam it to the TV. That's a really good beam point. It. Right. That's what I do too. I, I mean like that, I never thought that I would find myself asking, you know, telling my kids like, get down here. We're watching TV as a family. Like we're going to finish modern family. Like you, you all, you guys come in here and uh, yeah. Cause they, they just want to do it by themselves in their room and watch whatever exactly they want to watch. So now it's like, I'm forcing them to watch TV when we used yeah. to not have a TV. And the irony is not lost on me that at the time that we did not have a TV, I worked for a TV station. Like I was on television and we didn't yeah. have a television. It's like Steve Jobs not having an iPad. You know, it's normal. It's it's so weird. And again, the whole like I I've tricked my daughter into quality time. I give her a free space, but we have like shows that we watch together. And I will tell you, I'm, since I'm not with her mom, it is an arms race on which shows that I start her on. Sometimes I let her watch one episode with me just so that if her mom wants to watch that season or something, like we were watching um 90210. And I was like, look, I got to get you in on this first. And everyone was like, oh, let's watch 90210. She's like, I'm already watching it with my dad. Only on episode two. But that was my season. And we get to watch together. And that's the thing. Like, she can't watch it without me. I can't watch it without her. Like, we're watching Gossip Girl right now. We're, we're on season six. It's great. Like, you got TV. You got to trick the kids into spending time with you because they don't yeah. want to yeah. once they hit like 10. Right. We're going exactly. to have a shared yeah. family experience together, damn it. Exactly. That's yep. that's why I suffer through Riverdale, which is a terrible yep. oh, show. Boy. Oh, boy. She's trying to get me on Riverdale. It's so horrible. I got through three episodes, the way it's filmed, the way it looks. I can't do it. She's like, Dad, you make me watch. And it's true. I do have her watching 90210, all these old shows, you know what I mean, like the OC and stuff. So she's like, this is new. I'm like, it's so bad, though. <laughs> so I have to suffer through Riverdale, too. Well, give uh, that one to her mom. Give it as a I gift. should. I should. <laughs> Here, I want you to have Riverdale. I know, I know. What a kind gift.
Um, it's nice to know that we're all old, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I know. Well, I mean, we're not, we didn't even really talk about influencers, but that's the other thing. Like Instagram, I almost prefer the like, this is a commercial as opposed to like, you know, the um, makeup influencers yeah, who right. are selling makeup and, you know, just you never know, like the spo sponsor content, you just never know. Um, and they are sort of like they're they're critical with actual commercials, but not necessarily as critical but they're getting there. Like they definitely sponsors, understand. Yeah. Well, every like everybody got the new Osmo yesterday and everybody gives their review. And of course they're going to like it because they got it for free. There are certain things like that where she comes to me with people from YouTube or Instagram. And our whole, my whole concept is, okay, this person really loves this thing, right? All right. Let's go search a review from like 10 other people and go find out what they really think. Because somebody who's getting paid to do it, obviously they have a stake in it. And I always just direct them like, look, since you're watching junk anyway, go watch two other people. Or say or or search why this doesn't work, just so you can have an informed opinion. Because there's always another side to it. But yes, it, when they like someone, it's so bad right now because it's like, oh, I really like this guy. I trust him. And if you're not impartial, you get yeah. caught up. Right. Absolutely. And then and then all of a sudden they get canceled. Like my daughter's favorite YouTuber, James Charles, he's canceled. You didn't even know the words I just said, did you? Uh, no. <laughs> I mean, I vaguely slide. recognize that name, but I don't know if YouTube name or you don't need to names. know it anymore. Yeah, He's apparently not. <laughs> There's so many names out there to know. It's it's crazy. Yeah, yeah, it is. You know what else is crazy? Artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about AI doing some of the darndest things. So that cute AI doing the darndest <laughs> things in a moment. But first. This episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by Gazelle, the trusted online marketplace for buying certified pre-owned devices. You've set your creative and professional goals, uh, but do you have the right tools to tackle them? Well, it's time to upgrade your devices with Gazelle. Devices are available in fair, good, and excellent condition, all at great prices. Everything from iPhone 6 through 10 to a variety of Samsung Galaxy phones, they offer MacBooks, both Air and Pro. They also have iPads in standard Air and Pro configurations. Each device goes through a thorough thirty-point inspection period. Uh, just they they tear they take a look at it, make sure that everything's operating appropriately, make sure it's sellable and to their standard. Devices are backed by a thirty-day return policy, no restocking fee, and free shipping. All of their products are sold without a carrier contract and are available uh, for support by major carriers or unlocked. Financing is available if that's what you're looking for. It's, uh, you can finance all devices with a firm. You can get instantly approved and pay off in three, six, or 12 months. You just select financing with a firm at checkout to do that. With Gazelle's incredible selection of quality pre-owned devices, they're also an excellent choice for students. Uh, don't know what to do with your old devices. This is where it gets even better. You can check out Gazelle for competitive offers on your used phones, tablets, or computers. They happen to be taking up space in your drawer and you just know you're never going to use it again. You might as well get some money for it. So uh, trade it in and get some cash. Level up with new tech from Gazelle. Visit gazelle.com slash twit to buy a certified pre-owned device and get 10% off your purchase. That's gazelle.com slash twit. And we thank Gazelle for their support of Tech News Weekly. And now it's time for a little segment that we like to call Robots Do the Darndest Things. A Swedish distillery called MacMira announced a partnership with Microsoft to create the best whiskey using artificial intelligence. I am not a whiskey aficionado, but apparently whiskey is so expensive because it's hard to get it exactly right and it requires a lot of different tries with different ingredients. So they use machine learning models powered by Microsoft's Azure Azure Cloud. I always want to call it Azure. 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 I think with whiskey, it's Azure Cloud. Azure. Azure Cloud. It's like mature. Uh, and Azure Cognitive Services. Uh, sounds really good, AI whiskey. Um, so my question to you, Owen, is would you drink whiskey created by a robot? So the first thing they should have done was not tell anybody anything. Mm. I know it takes three uh. years to make whiskey, but you should have had the AI make this whiskey Put the whiskey out in the market, did a good marketing campaign about it, get a buzz about it. And once people love this whiskey, you can go and say, aha, it's made by robots, AI. And then people are like, oh, my God, this is so crazy. It's so good. Now all I am is skeptical about the arts of AI and whiskey because whiskey like wine there's a whole system to it. There's different things that make the, the water, the area you make it, the wood. So the AI is going to, okay, break it down to this, that, and that. 
okay, so I guess I'm going to get the same kind of thing all the time, which means I'm never going to luck out and get something amazing, which happens with whiskey and with wine sometimes. Um, can they do it? Sure. This is cool. But I would prefer to not have known up front so I didn't prejudge it in my mind. And a lot of whiskey drinkers who are connoisseurs are <laughs> going to frown at this. I'm sure they'll try it, but it just puts a bad taste in your mouth before you even get to taste it to me. Um, yeah, what, what you're saying kind of reminded me of something that they, they put in there where they, where someone said, uh, whiskey production is more art than engineering. And so when an AI or a computer is, is creating this, that takes it further into the engineering perspective. Cause right. You know, they, they're kind of finding the balance, the right ratios, the right time, all that kind of stuff. Um, but I mean, we're also seeing that algorithms, are doing a lot of things that are creative. I mean, would be creative if a human had done it, right? So are algorithms capable of creating art? I mean, if it, yeah. if it tastes good, then well, I guess it works. 100%. Somebody right now is getting paid $2 million to paint a dot on a white canvas. So, I mean, I'm sure a machine could figure out how to create art that people would love or whiskey that people would love. I'm just being judgmental because I'm an old fuddy-duddy. And uh, like a perfect example for me of how stuff is like, uh, one time I was in Napa and I got a, on this tour and I hate wine, I hate wine. And, you know, people who grow uh, wine do all stuff to like, no, you got to try my wine. I was drinking stuff straight out of barrel. And guess what? It was the best wine I ever had in my life. And I was wasted for two days straight. And I was like, why doesn't wine taste like this? And he's like, well, this wine you're drinking isn't going to be served to people for five more years. It won't taste anything like this. You can't get this. And I'm like, I can't get this? He's like, no. I was like, well, give me a milk gallon of jug so I can just take this right now and keep drinking it. So their, <laughs> their whole process of it, you, you miss out on things because, you know, they're old world and they've been doing it a long time. Again, I believe AI could replicate that, but I also feel like. I'm going to be getting the same exact product over and over again, which in some cases is exactly what you want. Vodka is vodka, right? So, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. true. I get it. Yeah. I mean, the other thing they pointed out is that um, the uh, whiskey tasters aren't necessarily losing their jobs because they have to still taste it. Like robots can't really taste right. whiskey yet. So robots wouldn't, uh, wouldn't necessarily know that something is good. Right. They're just the ones putting it together and, yeah, I don't know. It's, Coming up with different combinations. Really and then a taster would come in and go, Oh, that was good. And yeah. that, that would be where the actual yeah, one day, the one day AI from. will be able to slap someone in the face for disrespect in their whiskey right, tasting. Exactly. And it's not How like, dare yeah. you? How dare it's you? It took me 3.2 seconds to compilate this whiskey. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so they're not real robots with, you know, robot arms or no. anything. What? Like that. No. Wait a minute. What? Well, it's no, out it's rhythm. just there. It's wearing AI. a bartender's uh, outfit. You know, yeah. No, it's machine learning and. You know, yeah. it's, it's all in the cloud. As they're, they're doing a lot of that stuff with marijuana fields and all kinds of like farms and stuff. So, I mean, it's not new. It's just new for alcohol. Again, I'm going to have to try this stuff now. And now I need to know, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not, I'm not a big whiskey guy either, but now I'm like, oh, you know, yeah, you know. I'd try that. Yeah. I'd try that. Uh, in more AI doing stuff news. Google has been busy working on its own language translation capabilities. We heard a little bit about this uh, and have for years now at Google I.O. AI has been critical to the mathematical gymnastics for sure as relates to that. But Google just unveiled something called the Translatotron, which is essentially a project that will translate spoken word into, into another language. So in this case, translating from Spanish to English, but retain the voice of the original speaker in doing so. <laughs> so basically, um, I have, uh, if you scroll down to the very bottom of that article, uh, there's, there's a set of, of links for, for playback. Not the first set here, but below this, there's another set. And I can kind of walk you through it. So that first, the first link there is the input. This is the Spanish phrase spoken by an original person. Go ahead and play it. Larry me preguntó cómo me sentía y creo que es cuando empecé a llorar. Then the second one is the phrase translated by a real person in English. This is a reference. Larry asked me how I felt, and I think that is when I started to cry. And the third one is a standard Google translation, something that you would be expect to hear through like assistant. I wondered how I felt, and I think that's when I started to cry. Which which translated it a little bit differently. Like that was Google's traditional translation um, 
algorithm or whatever, from what I understand anyway. So it's, it differs a little bit from the human translation. Number four is the assistant voice translation based on the real person's translation. Larry asked me how I felt, and then I think that's when I started crying. And that gets you to this last one, which is that translation, but in the voice of the original speaker. Larry asked you how I felt, and I think it's when I started to cry. Although he sounds a little drugged up, but <laughs> still. Play, play the first and the last back to back. Yeah, do the first and the last back to back. Larry me preguntó cómo me sentía, y creo que es cuando empecé a llorar. Larry asked you how I felt. And I think it's when I started to cry. It's not perfect. He's had too much AI whiskey, I think. Though. Yeah, I think <laughs> I think that's when I started to cry. Um, it's not perfect, but I. it's just something I'd never thought of before, like a translation that would do it in the voice of the original person. It's just so cool what AI is doing in this stuff. What do you think, Odakta? This is scary. I don't know about cool. <laughs> this is not cool. This is not cool. Look, uh, first of all, Anything that translates and works is amazing. I'm an international traveler, man of mystery, and I only speak uh, one and three thirds of languages. I speak like, I pick it up. I'm there for three weeks, I get what's going on. But otherwise, I use translators, or I have somebody there for me. The fact that this thing is emulating my voice, drugged up or not, is creepy, uh, especially if you live in a world where people just take audio clips and put in words that you never said and put stuff in there, and now I'm just sending my voice into Google and Google's replicating my voice back in another language? Yeah, that's scary. It's the future. That is amazing technology. And if it works a little bit better, I will definitely be traveling more often speaking into my phone like a psychopath when I'm trying to talk to people. Oh, I wonder if it translates like if you're yelling at somebody like if you know what I mean, like if your voice is all high pitched and you're angry, does it translate back <laughs> in, the, in the tone of your voice? Oh, that'd be amazing. Oh, I, I would imagine so. I would hope so. Oh. I see so many Spanish mothers yelling at kids. I'll be out there just translating it back so I can hear what's going on. Yeah. It'd be amazing. I need that. Come on, Google. I uh, This is the future, and I'm here for it. I love this idea. Um, I Because I, I have been using Duolingo to try to learn Spanish for, I don't know, since Duolingo began. And I... I just can't like I I was bad at languages in high school and in college and I don't think that I'll ever be able to learn languages and so that makes me reticent to travel because I'm you know afraid to not speak the language so if I could just put in my uh, you know, my AirPods and they have their AirPods and we just talk to each other and it comes out in their voice like I love it I think this is great because I mean, some people are bad at learning languages, but that shouldn't keep us from communicating with yeah, whoever. That would be cool. You probably be need some Google Buds, though, not <clears throat> AirPods. You'd yeah, probably. Need some. probably just saying, yeah. I probably need some Google Buds or just like a chip <laughs> built into my brain. That's that's the future. Hey. That's your kids will have to deal with with that reality. Kids, no video game system. Mom's going in for surgery for three days. I'm yeah, having exactly. a chip installed. Don't worry about it. Um, I'll be fine. Robo mom family. shows back up on Monday. <laughs> family priorities. There you go. Uh, yeah, and I, I would appreciate if the the translation really took into effect the fact that everyone should sound drunk when they are mm -hmm. when you are mm -hmm. speaking to them. Mm -hmm. That would make me happy. Yep. Everyone should sound like Owen if, after he's been in Napa. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Two days. That, 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 they couldn't handle it. It'd be rough sledding with that going on. I'm uh, so confused but, yeah. about why they won't let us drink the wine that tastes better than what we get in the bottle. Because apparently I'm not the normal consumer of wine. Most people like reds that are dark and rich and bitter. Like I was drinking red wine. That wasn't like Riesling, but it was in between Riesling and red wine. Like it was a happy medium. It wasn't super sweet, but it was just so good and it was fresh and vibrant. And they just don't sell it like and that it because that's not the traditional way of creating wine. Very weird. I asked multiple people. Everyone kept shutting me down and told me no. <laughs> no one would give you a pour out of the out of the. Uh, uh, no, they let me drink while I was there. I just couldn't get any home. I was like, I'll buy bottles. Of this you just ship it to me. They're like, that's not how it works. So you don't very interesting, there, sir. Now, um, although I do kind of want to drink a glass of wine now, so <laughs> I'm not sure. Maybe I'll be the drunk translated guy. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Doctor Owen oh, JJ Stone. It's so great to get you on. I'm sorry it's been so long, uh, but we love having you here, and we thank you for taking some time to talk about a few stories with us. Appreciate you guys having me. Missed you. Miss you too. Uh, IQMZ.com. Anything else you want to plug while you're here? Oh, talk about bad parenting. Um, 
Um, I, the only thing I've done recently is uh, raising a ninja podcast. I got four new episodes up with my daughter, and we just talk about life and stuff that's real. The episode is going up tomorrow. It's uh, Endgame Depression. There's Endgame Movie Spoilers, and we talk about depression and school and stuff like that. We talk about some real serious topics. My daughter's so deep, it's amazing. That's so awesome. if you want to check out me list talking to a kid about punk stuff, uh, I'm on the internet doing stuff. Wait, what's so that saying. podcast called? Raising a Ninja. Raising a Ninja okay. podcast. It's, it's mainly, we're we're going to talk about you and your video game system, too, awesome. on our next episode. Oh, good, good. So I'll make sure you get it directly. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah, please CC me on that. Oh, Thanks, and it's guys. always a pleasure. We'll talk to you soon. See ya. Take care, man. Uh, we have a survey for you. Uh, it actually focuses on how you use collaborative software at work. We'd appreciate it if you could take the time. It's brief. It takes about six minutes, does not collect any personal data. You can go to twit.to slash survey14 to do that. And we thank, thank you so much if you can uh, do that for us. We really appreciate it. We'll give you a high five of our own. Uh, Tech News Weekly records live every Thursday starting at 11 a.m. Pacific at twit.tv slash live. You can be part of the show by emailing us at tnw at twit.tv. And you can subscribe to our show. Go ahead and do it. Oh, wait. We're still waiting. Oh, oh wait, you did that already? Oh, okay, <laughs> yeah. you're you're cool. You're I also didn't hook. tell you. Twit.tv slash TNW. You can wait till the end of the show. Then go subscribe all and right. follow us on the social media. We're on Twitter. We're on Instagram. So you can find all the Twit accounts. Uh, you can get uh, news of our shows coming out. Um, there's some back, you know, behind the scenes stuff you get. And if you want to tweet at me, I am always at Megan Maroney. And I'm always at Jason Howell. Thanks to John and John and Burke and Alex. And did I miss anyone? Colleen was in here for a second. Oh, and also, of course, Mike Dean from San Diego for making us feel special by sitting in the audience here. And thanks to you for watching. We'll see you next week on Tech News Weekly. Bye, everybody. I put a link to Raising a Ninja. I didn't know you were doing that. Yeah. See, I'm the kind of the worst person because um, when I get working for like client work and stuff like that, I never finish my own stuff. I got so much stuff I want to do, mm -hmm. but I'm off this summer. So I've got like, I had like four episodes canned and she's really into it. So when we talk about like serious stuff sometimes, like she, um, she actually had a bad day and the teacher wrote me an email like, Oh, your daughter's depressed. I'm like, you don't know my daughter. She's not depressed, but thanks for the update. You know what I mean? But I talked to her about it and we had a conversation and it's good because people always ask me, how do you talk to your kid? I mean, whatever. So you can listen to her, tell her stories and it's funny. It's amusing. And uh, yeah, it's, good. it's awesome. good stuff. I want to know how to talk to a kid. Yeah. <sighs> Look, let me tell you, she she is she is a little. I'll tell you one quick story from a podcast to tell you how interesting it is. She's watching a movie in school because they had park testing. And uh, two scientists are trying to save the world. There's ash falling everywhere on a military base. One guy's left a military base. The military guy lets him in and he's like, okay, I only got food enough for five days. My daughter stops and says, Dad, I don't know why they didn't kill the one guy. The one scientist knows everything. The military guy knows the keys and the guns and all that kind of stuff. They should have just killed the third guy. And I'm like, well, did they kill him? She's like, no. I said, well, what made you? She's like, Dad, we got to survive. This is survival. I don't have time to feed another person when we're trying to save the world. There's not enough food for all three of us. Two people are viable. One person's got to go. And I'm like, who, who raised you? <laughs> What is going on? That had nothing to do with the movie. Calm down. I got to watch my, I got to make sure I stay useful. Yeah, my, stay my useful. My own child trying to get rid of me, you know? <laughs> so it's, uh, you know, it's we, we always talk about this, so we record it now, and it, it's fun hearing the things that come out of a kid's head. That's amazing. So, I love it. I love it. Yeah.